Here are some images uh, that represent uh, many parts of the world. This image is from Mozambique, and it shows interconnectedness between the economic, the environmental, and the social. Women are looking for firewood. It's a resource. It's used for cooking and so on, for keeping families warm. But with deforestation, it's taking much longer. And what happens is that what used to take two hours can take as much as five or six hours. Also, when firewood is burnt in a small hut, it means that the person cooking is breathing that smoke, which is very harmful as well. So there are local environmental issues to consider as well. And finally, because it takes so long to find firewood, Sometimes girls are sent to look for firewood rather than sent to schools to study. So there are social implications as well to think about. This is an image that shows what technology can do in the hands of subsistence entrepreneurs and subsistence customers. It's a very optimistic image, and certainly one hopes that the solutions you develop will be part of solving some of these grand challenges. Now, on the other side, you see images like this, amazing malls around the world and in emerging contexts, uh, which show how wealth has been created for part of society. Uh, this is an image of Mumbai, uh, and this is where I grew up. And when you look at it, this is also an image of Mumbai. So you see side by side uh, the story of emerging markets as well. Take a look at this image of Shanghai in 1990 and 2010. It's amazing to see the transformation, the wealth creation and so on. Shenzhen in 1982 and Shenzhen again a few years ago. And so what you see is that much of the share of world GDP is moving to emerging markets. The center of equilibrium economically is moving away from advanced economies. You see a number of different graphs here that show how emerging economies are poised to keep on growing in terms of GDP. One way to think about it is a large proportion of people being added to the world are going to be in emerging markets. You're moving along and you see a car to the right, which could be the United Kingdom, a car to the left, which could be Germany. And you're moving along, except that you're going at 20 miles per hour. Now in your rear view mirrors, you are seeing some puffs of smoke, and those are emerging markets coming along quite fast, which then begs the question, what are we going to create of value 10 years from now? And this is not a question that's meant to alarm you. It's just meant to think about how we're going to solve grand challenges, how we're going to make a livelihood, how we are going to create value, and so on. There are a number of trends to keep in mind, like people moving to cities is in the billions as per projections. When you look at the population of the world, I want to tell you the story of when I was born. I was born on October 31st, 1962, when the population of the world was about 3 billion. It was literally on the day I turned 50, I believe, when the official population of the world reached uh, 7 billion. I'm 60 now, and if you give me a normal lifespan, a greedy lifespan, let us say, the population of the world is going to be about nine, nine and a half billion when I turn 80, if you give me that lifespan. So in one lifespan, we have tripled the world's population, which begs a lot of questions in terms of the collision courses that we are on. We are on a collision course in terms of basic necessities being there. We are on a collision course in terms of drinking water. And we are also on a collision course in terms of the harm that we are doing to the environment. So a number of things to keep in mind in terms of emerging markets and business for good. The center of economic equilibrium is moving rapidly to emerging markets. Poverty and the environment are large global challenges to confront. And so these are a couple of things to keep in mind as well. Let's talk a little bit about sustainability and business for good. Once again, you can see Shanghai in 1990 and then in 2010, but this is also Shanghai. There's a lot of wealth creation, but there's also a lot of pollution to go along. 
And so this is the dilemma, to grow but grow in a way that's sustainable. You see this in so many different places in the world in terms of polluted lakes and rivers. Again, this is Mumbai, formerly Bombay, and this is also Mumbai, formerly Bombay. You see this kind of a body of water and what's happened due to pollution. This is not just in emerging markets. This is a picture from North America. And you see what's happening to waterways in North America as well. This is London. You have deforestation, you have desertification, you have overfishing, uh, you have so many different issues, e-waste, sea level rise, and so on. And so the challenge for you is going to be to find a way to grow, because growth in demand is a given, and many of the people who are being added to the population are going to be poor trying to come out of poverty. But then, growth in supply is definitely not a given. So how do you grow and meet that demand and do so in a sustainable way. So it's going to be the challenge of your generation to try to do so and to try to turn the ship towards a more sustainable path. So what is sustainability? There are lots of different definitions. My definition is very simple. Can I look a young person in the eye and say, I'm living in a way that is not taking away from your chances of a better future? And the reality is I cannot look you in the eye because I am consuming not only the interest, I'm consuming the principle as well. You know, economists often say that, you know, there is no free lunch. Well, actually, there has been a free lunch called natural resources, or we thought it's a free lunch, and it turns out that I got the free lunch and your generation is paying for it. And that is unconscionable. So for me, that is what sustainability means fundamentally. You can look at sustainability in a variety of ways. You can think about water bottles. You can think about how much water it takes to make them. You can think about the oil that goes into making them. You can think about where it is disposed of, and you can think about where it really ends up. So we have to think about our products in much more circular ways and where they end up, not only where they come from. This to me is a picture of growth and consequences. On the left, we have things we want. They represent science and technology and progress. But on the right, you have species extinction and carbon dioxide and so on. And these are the consequences as well. Now, the interesting thing is that both of these charts have plots that are off the charts. And moreover, they're all off the charts starting at the same time when consumption began to increase in the 50s and 60s. And so this is something to keep in mind as well. So as Albert Einstein said, we need a new way of thinking to solve the problems caused by the old way of thinking. Let's talk about sustainability and profitability. Do businesses care? Are they changing? Is it profitable? So here is the return on investment from a sustainable set of companies versus not so sustainable sets of companies. So studies are showing that more sustainable companies are also more profitable. Now, it doesn't matter if a study shows this or not, as far as I'm concerned. We have to find a way to be more sustainable. That's not a choice. It's interesting to look at when a lot of these topics took off. They were in the mid-2000s. And you can see that businesses have become more involved and have missions that reflect sustainability as well. So when it comes to sustainability and profitability, do businesses care? Yes, more and more do. Are they profitable? Yes, you can be sustainable and profitable. Do businesses care? Yes, more and more do. Are they changing? Yes, are they changing fast enough? No. And is changing fast enough sufficient with the status quo? I don't think so. There has to be a way to put a cost to carbon.